according to an article on medium.com, so you know it's true, it's the internet, but we'll go with that. The odds of you being born are one in 400 trillion. And what we're going to talk about today is something that only you can do and you need to master it to have a successful podcast. Hit it, ladies. The School of Podcasting with Dave Jackson. Podcasting since 2005. I'm your award-winning Hall of Fame podcast coach, Dave Jackson, thanking you so much for tuning in. If you are new to the show, this is where we talk about how to plan your podcast, how to launch your podcast, how to grow your podcast. If you want to monetize, I got a book about that at ProfitFromYourPodcast.com. But what I really want you to check out is my website. That's the school of podcasting.com. And I got a coupon code for you. If you go there and type in the coupon code listener, that's L-I-S-T-E-N-E-R, that'll save you 20% on either a monthly or yearly subscription. And of course, that comes with a 30-day money back guarantee. And today we are going to talk about a skill that should come easy to you and yet It doesn't. And what is that skill? It's kind of weird. Should we start off with a humble brag? Let's start off with a humble brag. We'll get this out of the way. In 2018, in the city of brotherly love, I was inducted into the Academy of Podcasters Hall of Fame. Now, there is a board that makes up this particular Hall of Fame area. And so, essentially, I was voted in by my peers. And that really really touched me. It wasn't something when I started out in the basement of my brother's house, I just wanted to help people and I knew I could do it on a global scale. So I was very humbled when that happened, but then something happened that I didn't quite think, hmm, that's an interesting side effect. And that is it really messed with my head. It really, every time I turned on the mic, I was like, is this Hall of Fame material? Is it Hall of Fame? Is it this? Is it, is this worthy of a Hall of Fame? And it really, really jacked with my head. And then I finally, because I was like, I got to put an episode out this week. And I said, okay, let's, let's reverse engineer this a bit. Why did they vote you into the podcaster's Hall of Fame? And I was like, well, when I ask people, they like me because I'm kind of entertaining funny and they I typically they say I learned something with when I listen to your show and I was like okay so that's kind of how I picture myself and I was like so really what I need to do here is be myself I just need to be me keep doing what I was doing because when you start to look at other people and other things it can really again number one it'll ruin your ego Because I've said before, the worst thing you can do is compare your show to somebody else. Now, why is that? Because you have four kids, two jobs, and soccer practice every day at four. They have no kids, no spouse, and six figures in the bank. That's not really a fair comparison. Other things that include that is you're doing a show about pygmy ponies in Iowa. They're doing a show about being fat after 50 everywhere. So when you compare downloads, it's like, yeah, that's just not fair. And so I was doing my show. I do a live show every Saturday. If you want free podcast consulting about your podcast, go over to askthepodcastcoach.com slash live. It's a show I do with Jim Cullison from Home Gadget Geeks. And I believe John called in with this question. In your opinion, because you're like, a, you know, a podcasting guru, what do you think makes Joe Rogan, what do you think makes him so popular? Now I realize for some, Joe Rogan is a bit of a lightning rod. You're like, oh, I hate that guy. And other people are like, oh, cool. He's going to talk about Joe. And that's one of the reasons the guy's popular. He has an opinion and he's willing to share it. But. Well, as we talked about this, there was one point I wanted to bring out because I did a YouTube video about this and I will have that in a link out at school of podcasting.com slash eight four five. But as we were talking about it on Saturday morning, Dan 
from Based on a True Story podcast brought up a good point because I brought up that, hey, Joe started his comedy career in 1988 and he moved to L.A. in 1994. That is six years later to do television. Now, I believe it took him a few years to even get his first comedy album. But Dan brought out that, hey, while he's cutting his teeth in Boston, he's learning to entertain people. He's learning how to work a crowd, how to see who his audience is, and adapt to whatever crowd that he had. And I think that's a key point. He didn't just show up and get two bazillion downloads. In fact, I have a clip out at the website, schoolofpodcasting.com slash 845, and I would love just to play the whole thing, but there's that whole copyright thing, and I am going to kind of lean a little bit today on that whole, remember, this is a defense that you use in court, which is fair use, and I really hope I don't have to use that, but I'm going to play a couple clips today, and because I, I consider this an educational format, but Joe started in 1988. Six years later, moves to L.A. to do news radio. That's a NBC. It's a national radio show, not radio, national TV show. 97, he started working with the UFC. That's that whole fighting thing. Nine years, by the way, nine years after he started. In 2000, he released his first stand-up special. That is 12 years after he started. In 2001, he started hosting Fear Factor. In 2003, he takes over hosting The Man Show on Comedy Central. In 2003, also, he was involved in Last Comic Standing. That was a television show that was pretty popular. And in 2006, he's off of TV and he goes back to comedy. And then in 2009, he launches his podcast. Now, let's look at the calendar. That is 12 years ago that he launched his podcast after basically 20 years in the entertainment industry. And I know you might be thinking, look, that guy's got 20 years in the entertainment industry. I can't get 20 minutes. I am just completely paralyzed with imposter syndrome. Well, you know who else had imposter syndrome? That's right. Joe Rogan. But he he talked me into it. And then I went to an open mic night, and then I realized that, oh, open mic nights, everyone sucks. Like, you're just trying to start out. Yeah. Like, it, we're all amateurs. So my thought was, like, well, at least I won't be as bad as the worst guy. You know, I'll probably be better than the worst guy. So maybe I could try this. And then I went up and I did it. And then once I did it once, I knew I was going to do it. Like, when did you stop it. feeling like a loser? A couple weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm not convinced. Do you secretly feel like, do you, do you, are you insecure still? Are you, do you struggle with self-esteem at all? No, currently? Not, not really. Not yeah. anymore. But I used to definitely have uh, imposter syndrome, mm. you know, like even when things are really good, like I'd go to a sold out theater and like they'd introduce my name and like, as I was walking out and people were cheering, I'd be like, this is not oh, real. Yeah. This does not seem real. I'm tricking these people once again yeah you know and even when it, when it was over i'd be like oh tricked them again you know yep and so in studying this i did find one video again school of podcasting.com slash 845 where joe is answering questions about podcasting and the one person that was kind of talking to him said you don't even have a co-host like you can't do a podcast without a co-host and joe said look when i am talking to you the guest, I come up with a question and then all my focus goes on you. And he said, podcasting is about listening and thinking. And I was like, ooh, that's good because it really does come down to it. Mark Marin, when he was at Podcast Movement, somebody said, what's the biggest skill you need to be a successful podcast? And the answer is listening. Now, I'm not a prima donna, I'm not an egomaniac, but I was on a show, well, I, I don't know that this has aired yet, but I was interviewed and someone introduced me like this. Dave, I'd like to welcome you here. So you run a company called School of Podcast. Now, in theory, I should have stopped him right there and said, hey, just to maintain your integrity, this isn't about me. I don't want this guy to look stupid. And so in my answer, I made sure to say this. I needed a new degree in teaching. And so I started the school of podcasting. 
And sadly, he referred to the School of Podcast two more times in that interview. Again, I don't really care, but somebody's going to Google that and go, oh, wow, the host kept calling it School of Podcast. It's School of Podcasting. So it really is key that you listen. I have at times answered a question that was just ripe for a follow-up question, and instead someone would just go to their sheet and go to the next question because that's what they're there for. It's not really a conversation. I just need to ask you these nine questions and then hope that money falls from heaven. Now, for the record, I only listen to Joe when I see a guest that I want to hear, and I do like his long form. Now, I also think that Joe could really handle a little editing. My favorite is when Joe watches something on YouTube and you get to listen to him react. Ooh, ah, wow. Oh, did you see that? Actually, no, Joe, I didn't. I'm listening to this. But listen to the environment. Listen to the environment that his guest, that he knows, he has a reason he brought them in, but listen to the environment because it's not politically correct. This is from episode 1360 with Nikki Glazier. PETA kills animals because they think that their policy is that it's you're more free to be dead than you are. I don't know. I, well, I don't want to put words in their mouth. I think that's it. They definitely kill animals. So he opens the door by saying, I don't know. And not many people will say that. They Some people think they have to know everything, but not Joe. He's like, no, I don't, not 100% sure about this, but I am sure about this. And then he continues on talking about PETA. Like, they're the kind of type of people that, like, break into f- uh, supermarkets and release the lobsters back to the ocean. Be free. Be free, my I'm lobster I'm into it, friend. Joe. Are you? I'm into it. I'm those, a total vegan. I know you are. Bleeding heart. Yeah, I know you are. But those lobsters have always made me so sad. Why? They're bugs. Do you swat mosquitoes? I rarely kill bugs. When mosquitoes are f***ing you up, you just let them, please divinely eat me, drink of my blood. No. You are me no. and I am you. And if you give me malaria, then so be it. Yeah, I know. Did you hear that? That was two people who had two different opinions. And not only did they get through that conversation without calling each other Nazi, because you do realize if you don't think like me, you're a Nazi. That's the word. It drives me nuts. Nazi is a super powerful word. And I hate to hear somebody just like, wait a minute. You think Michael Jordan was better than LeBron? You're a Nazi. I'm like, oh, come on now. Let's reserve that word for a little bit. But not only did they not argue he was actually kind of poking fun at her opinion. And call me crazy, where do you do that? You do that with friends you trust. And Joe talks about how he picks his guests. You know, you don't have to listen. <laughs> and it's not like your brand. You just no. are who you are, and that's what you do. But yeah. it's like, it's authentically what I'm interested in. All the podcasts, whether I'm talking to David Fravor about his experience with UFOs, whether I'm talking to uh, David Sinclair about life extension, whether I'm talking to you about artificial intelligence or what, it's because I want to talk to these people. Yeah. And that that resonates. And that's the key word. It resonates. It's legitimate. It is authentic. And if you want to see inauthentic interviews Watch Jimmy Fallon, watch the other Jimmy Kimmel, whoever. Listen to David Letterman talk about how he would find out from his producer, today you're interviewing so-and-so, and it's some singer that's super popular with the 14-year-olds, and Letterman's like, I don't know, 115. He doesn't know who this person is. They hand him five questions and go and make it funny. That's the kind of interview that Joe is not doing. He's like, hey, I started this podcast because there are people I want to talk to because I find them interesting. And at the beginning of that clip, you heard the interviewer kind of say, oh, that's your brand. Because Joe said, look, there are times he goes, I did an entire episode on cars. And he goes, and some people said, I don't want to hear you talk about cars. And Joe was like, that's fine. There are 13 other 100 episodes that you can listen to. Now, Joe can kind of get away with that, again, because he's entertaining. He's got great guests, and not everything is going to be a home run out of the park. But I just thought it was interesting because that's where I want to go today is what that guy said. Joe said, hey, it's me. It's authentic. So how is Joe Rogan popular? And the answer is... Because he's Joe Rogan. 
And he's really good at being Joe Rogan because being Joe Rogan is pretty easy to him. He's not looking at somebody else and going, oh, how can I be more like them? Or how can I do this? He's being Joe Rogan. It's authentic. He's doing what he likes. And it is, keyword, resonating with an audience. And I know you're probably screaming at the car dashboard or something right now going, Dave, he's a celebrity. Back on episode 783, I had a conversation with Rob Greenlee, who has worked with many celebrities. And guess what? No, being a celebrity does not make you automatically famous. It doesn't automatically make your podcast good. Case in point, Michelle Obama with uh, Barack Obama, Barack Obama with Bruce Springsteen, Amy Schumer, all of those shows underperformed, even though they were giant celebrities. You can't get much more celebrity than the president of the United States. So it's not just celebrity. That might get you people to click play, but it's not going to get you to click play twice. You still have to entertain people. And if you're new to the show, this is my list. You have to make people do one or hopefully more than one of the following. That's laugh, cry, think, groan, educate, or entertain. So hopefully you're educating them while you're entertaining them and while you're making them laugh or cry. If you can combine those, then you're not boring. If you're not doing any of those, I'm sorry, you are boring. Now, the hard part is to explain this is if you ask Joe, how does he do it? He said, "Ah, I listen and I think, but many of the really great people, it's just them being them. They make it look easy, but in the end, They are just being themselves. And I realize sometimes, again, that seems hard to do because, A, maybe you don't like yourself and you don't want to be yourself. I don't know. Or sometimes you just think, ah, who would listen to me? That whole imposter syndrome. I was listening to an episode of Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend, and he was interviewing Leslie Jones. And she did the same thing. She got hired because she was funny. She steps into Saturday Night Live and she's surrounded by all these really famous and really funny people and she couldn't figure out what to do. I was just in that position of just like, I need to impress him. I need to feel like, you yeah. know, you need to feel like you sure. need to be. I've been there. right there with and that you don't man have and to felt do the same that. way. Yeah, you don't, yeah. you just be you. Like, I didn't know if I, if then I really wish I would have known that just be me. I didn't learn that until maybe six months into SNL that the way I was going to win at SNL was to be me. Yeah. You know, I was trying to be everybody else. Another interview was on Apple Music, and they were talking about the new Ozzy Osbourne album with Ozzy Osbourne and his wife, Sharon. And the interviewer twice tried to get Ozzy to explain, like, how do you do Ozzy? Like, how is Ozzy Ozzy? Like, it was a knob or a switch that you're like, oh, I need to sound like Ozzy now. I'll just flip this switch and turn this on and press this pedal and instead this is what Ozzy said. I wanted to ask you Ozzy that when you get it when it's time for you to record vocals and perform these songs and you step into the booth because you sound unbelievable on this record. I mean the vocal performances on this album are incredible. Well you know you know I just do I just do it from the heart you know I, I, I'm 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 my own worst critic. When the album's done and uh, I, I, I'm always looking for the faults, you know. I'm, I'm a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to my phrasing. Yeah. And I always say the good ones make it look easy. Listen to Ozzy's uh, producer of this record. You have never seen somebody double their voice the way that Ozzy does it. That's like what I was going to... I, I need to know how you do it because it is so is flawless. So notice the interviewer again is like, how do you do it? He is the best of all time. And that comes from years of having to do it to tape. You know what I mean? Like he literally gets the line, he closes it, he reads the lyric a few times and he closes his eyes and he goes for those takes from the heart and your hairs rise on your arms. And then after you're like, it couldn't get any better than this. He goes, okay, now let me double it. And mm-hmm. then you jump in the air. You're like, it's f-ing you know what I mean? Like it's just that <laughs> sound. Like, that so is sound. this is what I'm going to try to get to, and and please be be generous with me as I as I form this question in my head because it's complicated for me to try to express. When you are in that moment, Ozzy, when it's time to sing, 
not talk to me mm-hmm. in the press or, you know, deal with this meeting or that meeting or all the other stuff that happens either side of that. Is that when you are at your most present? Is that is that when you are at the most do peaceful? I it, you know. I've been doing it 54 years, and if I don't know what I'm doing now, I shouldn't be doing it. Still trying to figure out how he does it, he asks again. Yeah, but how do you get to the emotional place so readily? I don't know. It's, uh, I just turn into Ozzy, and then I just do it. I don't think about it. You know. So the point here is Ozzy can't explain how he's Ozzy because he's just being Ozzy. And I know what you may be thinking, but Dave, there's this other podcast and they just, they're awful. And when I look at the charts, because I spend most of my days looking at the charts and looking at my stats, he said snarkily, they're above me and that drives me nuts and it makes me angry and jealous and all that other fun stuff. Well, I'm going to explain how some people handle that in just a second. Look. I get it. I really do. There are people, look, I started in 2005 and there are people that have started in podcasting that blew right by me and are making more money in a month than I will in a year. I totally get that. But you have to remember why did you get into this? But it is frustrating. And I want to say that it's kind of natural if you're looking at other people to get frustrated. Here's Nikki Glaser on the Joe Rogan show. Instead of getting mad at like, why is that person so successful? I'd just go, uh, well, their audience needs that. And they, they're they not going to enjoy you. They can't. And not because they're not smart enough. It's just like, I don't, not, I don't speak to them. And I can't speak to everyone. And that's frustrating. And so Nikki makes a point there that I want to make sure we all caught. Think about this. In some cases, one show by design might have a larger audience. So let's say I'm doing fitness for the 40s, meaning people over 40. It's a fitness show. I'm not even going to niche down to men and women. It's a wide audience. Now, I might have a more loyal audience if I niche down to men or women, but I'm just going fitness over 40. That There's probably a show named that. If not, start one. I like that name. And however, then somebody else starts a show about Jack Benny, who, if you watch and they talk about Rochester, holy cow, is that like not going to work today? Jack Benny was before my time. He might have even been before my mom's time, but he was an early radio guy who later transitioned to TV. Well, think about that. Anybody who is interested in Jack Benny is probably about 96 about now, something like that. And so consequently, they may not be listening to podcasts, which means you're going to have a smaller show than the fitness over 40 people. So keep in mind that sometimes when we compare ourselves, which we shouldn't be doing in the first place, not only does person A, who's got more downloads, not have three kids and soccer practice at four and three jobs, like you do, but they also have a topic that might be resonating with more people than the behind the scenes of Jack Benny. Joe Rogan brought up this point that not everything is for everyone. There's a lot of movies that are for little kids that if you watch them, they're terrible. Like I watch kids, I watch movies with my kids and I was like, this movie is awful. And they're like, ah, yeah, it's not for you. It's for nine year olds. They think it's hilarious. And so when you get angry, when you get frustrated, there is, according to our good friends, the Internet, we're going to attribute this quote to Buddha, and that is holding on to anger, or we'll put in jealousy or anything like that. Holding on to anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. In fact, Joe talked about comparing yourselves directly. And then I remember thinking, like, this is a gigantic waste of time. And I got into comedy because I'm a fan of comedy. So when in doubt, go back to your why. Why did you start this podcast? That's always a good place to start. Back to Joe. And my concentrating on people that suck or being jealous about people that are doing well does me zero good. But instead, if someone does well, I can be inspired and I can get fired up by it. I mean, I figured this out in my early 20s. Wait, his early 20s, that would be, he was born in 1967, 
That would be around, I don't know, 1988 when he started doing comedy in Boston. So instead of getting frustrated and angry and mad and upset and jealous, what does Joe do? When I see someone just murder on stage, fuck, I want to go to work. Yeah. I want to go write. I want to get home and write. Yeah. I want to I want to go perform. I'm like, fuck, that guy just killed her. Holy shit, she just crushed. Her. She's out there killing it. And he's he's doing so good. It makes me want to work harder. And in that sense, as long as someone's not doing anything bad, as long as someone's not victimizing someone, what they're doing is they're they're showing you that it's possible to do better than you're doing. Yeah. And that's good. One other thing I want to point out about the fact that Joe said he figured that out in his 20s, I mentioned that he moved to L.A. I think that's a key ingredient because Joe was trying to attract people to hire him in the entertainment industry. And I always say, figure out who your audience is and go to where they are, whether that's physically or online. And that's exactly what Joe did. He moved to L.A. to get work. He was in Boston he could have gone to New York. It would have been closer, but instead he moved to L.A. He went to where his target audience, because the goal of his show was to grow an audience and get more gigs in the entertainment industry. So why are people so jealous of Joe Rogan? Because he got paid not one, but $200 million by Spotify to only have his content on Spotify. Now, there are clips on YouTube, small ones. But if you want to hear the whole interview, you have to go to Spotify. Well, here's what Joe says about making money in podcasting. What I tell people about podcasting is you can't make money in podcasting if you're trying to do podcasting to make money. <laughs> yeah. But if you sure. want to do a good yeah. job, if you just want to make a great podcast and you just keep doing it, you probably will. I can't guarantee you probably will make money. And that is from episode 1679 of Joe's show featuring one Adam Curry, one of the guys that invented podcasting. Now, another thing we should point out is, yes, previous to Spotify, Joe was everywhere and he started kind of on YouTube in a way. And I don't think it's the video that was the key ingredient there is it was the way for his audience to leave comments. In fact, right now, Spotify is working on adding comments to Spotify, and I would hazard a guess it's because one of their expensive stars on the network wants comments. Joe now has clips on YouTube. That is another key ingredient. It's easy to share. So that's another, I think, key ingredient to him getting popular. He made it easy. The other thing he did, granted, you had to sit through two or three hours to get to this, he had his guests say, holy cow moments. I remember when Bernie Sanders said that presidential debates are a complete waste of time because you just talk in sound bites. I remember when Ted Nugent mentioned that his child was a vegan and Ted is a big hunter. There are all sorts of things when Elon Musk smoked a joint that sent everybody a tizzy. So he had a certain amount of, oh my gosh, did you hear what happened on the show? So he had people wanting to share it, and he had content that people wanted to share, and when they wanted to share, he made it easy, and that's with these little clips. So that doesn't mean that to be Joe Rogan, you have to be on video. There is a whole other audience over there outside of podcasting, but I hate to see somebody who your show isn't growing, and you start up YouTube to grow it, because probably what you're going to do is just grow a headache and burn out. And so as we kind of wrap up this segment, Joe talks to people that he's excited to talk about. So if you're just getting somebody and you're talking to them because, hey, you've got a pulse and a microphone, you might want to change that strategy. As he said, it's transparent and it resonates with his audience. And he says, um, also, those people are interesting. He also creates a safe place where they can talk freely and not worry about triggering people. And this leads to information you can't get other places because other places are playing it safe. And right now, as you're listening to this in 2022, there are people looking into applying labels to podcasts so advertisers can identify the safe shows. And while we all enjoy, you know, taking our kids to G movies, I'm not sure how keen we are on listening to safe content 
24-7. And why is it going to be safe? Because, well, we're all mesmerized with advertising. And look, so am I. I know there are people that want to make money with their podcast, and they seem to think that's the only way you can make money. And while it is a way to make money with your podcast, there are other ways. And the other thing about Joe's show, it is a comedy. There is sarcasm. There are people cracking jokes about each other. They're actually cracking jokes about each other. And again, this is something you only do with your closest friends. And in this case, I think the jokes work because they're not inside jokes. They're jokes that can be enjoyed by everyone. He will follow a conversation into a dead end. And for the record, this is something I was like, I think I might edit that out. At one point in the Adam Curry interview, he asked himself, wait, what were we talking about that led to this topic? And so for me, I might edit that out. In fact, I'd edit out a a lot of things in Joe's show. I wouldn't try to make it a 20-minute show. That's ridiculous. But if it's a three-hour show, I'm pretty sure I could find 15 minutes there that we could edit out. But maybe in Joe's case, he feels it's not worth the time and effort. His primary list of guests are comedians. He did mention that. He said, look, that's my tribe. And they kind of have this unwritten network where they self-promote each other. The other thing is Joe is not afraid and accepts responsibility for doing what he wants to do. He did this also before he got the giant check from Spotify. And the interesting thing, speaking of Spotify, that we're all waiting to see is if Joe will stay with Spotify at the end of his contract. My money is on no. I don't think he's going to stay. A recent report came out stating that Spotify doesn't promote Joe's show when they mention other shows. And while he did get a boatload of money, he might have made more money had he stayed independent anyway. It's it's going to be fun to watch because he did have a few episodes that were pulled by Spotify. Remember, uh, there was the whole Neil Young thing. You know, I'm going to pull my songs from Spotify. You notice uh, Crosby, Stills, and Nash put their music back in. It's the, hey, we're out of money tour, I think will be coming. But I I do want to wrap this up. There was one great kind of synopsis from the Conan O'Brien show. The trick of this business isn't to figure out some new person that you should be who's funny or resonates with people. The trick is to figure out who you always were and then do that in a weird situation, which means lights, Mm -hmm. cameras. Mm -hmm. And microphones. The other thing that makes it really scary to be yourself is if you are being yourself and you're not popular, how do you not take that personally? And that is where I always like to remind people that there are shows that should have been popular that weren't. I know Jay Moore, the comedian, was on a show And it was all about kind of an inside look at the media. And the media loved it because it was about them. It was kind of snarky and it kind of took shots at some of the bad parts of the entertainment industry. So it was inside baseball and they loved it. And the bad news was it was up against friends. And so consequently, it was canceled. There's a thing called timing. There's a thing called luck. And in the end, all you can do is try to make the best show that you can make, and you'll either end up with a great podcast that resonates with your audience or a great story about that one time when you started a podcast. I'm going to throw in one last point. In listening to that interview with Ozzy Osbourne, he was talking about the reason his first solo album was so successful is he was in a band before called Black Sabbath and the guitar player would write a riff and he would have to come in and create a melody over it many times, forcing him to sing outside of his key. When he started his solo career, his guitar player was a guy by the name of Randy Rhodes, who I was a huge fan of. And he would come in with a melody and Randy would start to play over it. It was like, hold on a second your voice sounds better in this other key. And so you play to your strengths. So Ozzy sounded good in this key. Well, it might be easier to play on the guitar in this key, 
but it's going to the song is going to sound better if you play it in this key because the guitar will sound great and the vocal will sound great. So I say this because when we talk about being yourself, if you're kind of a serious person, maybe you don't lean so hard on the yuck yucks. And if you're a super funny person and you like to joke around, maybe you shouldn't do, and now it's time for the news. That might not work. Play to your strengths. And sometimes you don't know what your strengths are. Well, how do you do that? By recording a few episodes and knowing that you're never going to release them. That's the only way you know is to play. Play with a microphone and some software. Record some stuff. Listen back to it. Find some friends who will tell you the honest truth about what you just recorded. And play. And you will discover what you like to do. People have asked me, Dave, you mix in sound effects occasionally and other things. Why do you do that? Like, what inspired you to do that? And the answer was, I don't know. I thought it sounded like it needed a ha ha here or a ooh or what. It's just, it's in my head. And so I added, I have a ton of sound effects. And that's just a thing I do. I've heard other people say that if an interviewer interrupts and makes a point, oh, he's doing a Dave Jackson. I didn't realize I was inventing a thing when I'd be playing an interview and I would interrupt it and say, hey, I want to make sure you got this part. I want to make sure you got this point. Why did I do that? Because my background's in teaching and I want to make sure you got the point because I want to help you be a better podcaster. And now if somebody's doing an interview and all of a sudden they insert a, hey, I want to make a point here. I've had other people go, oh, he's doing a Dave Jackson. Now, that was just me being me. And sometimes when you follow your heart and you follow your head because, hey, you want to do it. We talked about this last week, I think it was, or two weeks ago. When do you go back to a subject? And the answer was, well, kind of when you feel like it, when you have something to authentically say. So a lot of this episode is about being authentic, following your heart, and realizing that in some cases, being you may not go over with everyone. As I said at the beginning of this show, when you say the name Joe Rogan, there are people that think he's this phenomenal free speech advocate and other people are like, that guy's an idiot. And that's kind of a good thing. Because if everybody went, Joe Rogan, meh, you know, that's not really the reception you want. Hey, what do you think of the show? Eh. <laughs> I'd rather have somebody go, oh, that guy's an idiot, or I love that guy. Because the people that are saying, I love that guy. She is awesome. She's my favorite. Those are the people that are going to go tell their friends. And speaking of telling your friends, if you could do me a favor, you've made it to the end of the show almost. We're very close. Don't tune out yet because I need a favor. Yeah, I'm serious about this. I normally do not ask for reviews. I kind of blow them off, but I just want to do an experiment. Back on September 7th, I received, wait for it, a one-star review. And if you're new to podcasting, if you haven't got a one-star review yet, you're not a real podcaster, but this is what they said. This show puts in the least amount of energy necessary. Well, I can tell you I've put in a lot of <laughs> effort into this episode. Recycled sketchy opinions and sketchy advice and sketchy services dripping with dude caster energy. This show doesn't know what it doesn't know and doesn't care and make sure the audience knows it. And some kind of postured brag. Well, I did do that at the beginning, but I did announce it. It was a humble brag. Podcasting needs to do better than this. So thank you to Violet from the United States. That was uh, wonderful. And so if you feel so moved, go to schoolofpodcasting.com slash follow. You'll see a link there for Apple iTunes, he said, because he's old. How about Apple Podcast? Yeah, I'm still on a PC as well. That would be great. And you could be like uh, Ms. Lofsky, who has already given me a five-star review that said, thanks for helping me learn. There's a lot to learn to start a podcast. Good to hear from an OG Hall of Famer how to do the things the right way. And then someone who forgot to put their name said, if someone you know is thinking about starting a podcast, this is the place. Dave knows all the ups and down. That is from Soul Driver 
three. And so if you'd like to ha- offset the one star review, that would be cool. Keep in mind, reviews do nothing for ratings or reviews. They are simply social proof. And I'm just like, well, if somebody needs some social proof, it'd be nice to offset that one star review. Hey, and while you're on your computer, I got another call to action for you. And that is go to schoolofpodcasting.com slash listener. And that coupon code I mentioned at the beginning of the show will automatically be added when you sign up for either a monthly or yearly subscription. And of course, that comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. And the great thing about it is if you're worried about doing this alone, you're going to be one click away. If you want to send me a text, yep. Want to send me audio? Yep. What about video? Yep. What about a PDF? Yep. Any kind of file? Yep. And you can do it from any device, Apple, Google, if you're on a Mac, if you're on a PC, you and I will be joined at the hip and I can help you guide you to creating a successful podcast that resonates with your audience. That link again, schoolofpodcasting.com slash listener. Next week, we're going to hear from Sonny Galt, who has a really cool resource, especially if you're a new podcast network. Until next week, take care. God bless. Class is dismissed.